Good morning and welcome to Seagate Church this morning. It's uh, fantastic that you can join us this morning as I uh, speak to you from uh, my back garden on a glorious uh, sunny morning here in Troon. Um, it's just lovely to, to be able to connect uh, with you. Uh, we hear there's a number of people watching from um, other places who maybe don't get the chance to meet with us on a Sunday morning and uh, we really want you to feel welcomed and uh, to feel part of the family um, here at Seagate as you um, listen to uh, Dylan lead us in worship, um, as you listen to Alison Tudor um, lead us in prayer and as Thomas McCulloch brings God's word to us. And we just pray you'd be blessed. My name's Mark Ingalls. I'm one of the elders at Seagate Church. And uh, we had an elders meeting this week and it was just fantastic to, to meet with my fellow elders, Gavin, Richard and Tom. In fact, Tom said, Mark, I like your beard, uh, but it makes you look really old. Uh, so uh, missing you already, Tom. Thanks. <laughs> You know, it's great to be part of a family and um, uh, we'd love each other and it's just, uh, it's great that we can continue to connect in this way. As we turn our thoughts uh, towards uh, the service, I just wanted to read from Psalm 23. Psalm 23 being a, set, uh, a psalm that's normally read um, at funerals and uh, but has relevance at a whole different points of our lives and I thought it had relevance for just now. And it says this, David says this, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be at want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me and your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before, before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A few things I just want to, to, to direct our thoughts towards is that the Lord is our shepherd, that he is our guide, that he goes before us like the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire uh, leading the Israelites in the wilderness. So the Lord is our shepherd right here, right now at this time. And he restores our souls. It's, it's a dependent upon him, not dependent upon our circumstances, not dependent upon the end of lockdown or um, the, the ending of COVID. No, it depends upon him that he alone restores our souls. And as we follow him, he guides us in his paths of righteousness for his name's sake, not for our comfort and not for um, our own glory, but for his name's sake, for there is no name that is higher. And even though dark times come, and even though there are valleys, and maybe you feel in the shadow at the moment, um, we need not fear, and we need not fear evil, for he is with us, and his staff and his rod, they comfort us. He makes a mockery of our enemies. He sets a table before the enemies that others are running from and fleeing from. God sets a table uh, for us uh, in front of our enemies, such as his confidence and his ability to overcome all foes. That even um, at, at this time, that my cup, my cup overflows, that I know his goodness and that his love will follow me all the days of my life and that I will be in his presence forever. Eternity starts now, folks. We are in his presence just now here on earth. And when we die, we just move on into another world where we are still in his presence and he is the consistent in all that. And the danger of times like this, when we feel that we're in the shadow of the valley, is that we can doubt God because of the hardship. And um, the temptation is that we can think that God no longer cares about us, that he doesn't hear us, that he doesn't... Um, he doesn't care about the difficulties that we're feeling. And that's, that's not true. That God allows us to go through tests and trials so that we can learn from that experience, that we can trust in him, that we can lean on him, that we can continue to follow him in the midst of that difficult time. And if we won't serve him um, in the, the, the difficult times, then we, then we won't serve him in the good times. And um, that we, will, we should constantly serve and worship him in the good times. Remember that the mountaintops encourage you, but the valleys mature you. And behind every shadow, there is a great light. And uh, as I look at the sun today, there is a great light. And it's the Lord Jesus. And uh, we trust and we hope in him at this difficult time. Let's just turn to prayer together. Our Lord Jesus, we just want to give you our worship and praise. We thank you that you are our shepherd. We thank you that you lead us, that your rod and your staff, that they comfort us, that they guide us, that they lead us. 
that you are the one who restores our souls, that it's not dependent upon circumstances or how we feel or whether things are good or bad, but Lord, you are that constant shepherd who leads us because you love us, that you know everything about us, you know the good things and the bad things and you still love us and you call us this morning to worship you, to take our eyes off ourselves, to take our eyes away from the the shadow that, that perhaps we feel creeping over us as we get tired of this whole situation. But Lord, you restore our souls. And I pray this morning that you would restore all those who are listening this morning. Restore our souls. Give us hope. Make our cups overflow with love and with joy as we turn and worship you. As we listen to uh, Dylan lead us in worship. As Alison Tudor leads us in prayer. And as Thomas, Thomas McCullough Cullough brings God's word. Lord, just open our hearts. Just guide us, lead us, and bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears They laid him down in Joseph's tomb The entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all Praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. The third at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. Oh, trample death, where is your sting? The angels roll for Christ the
Thanks, Dylan, for leading us into worship this morning. We're so grateful for the way you've been using your gifts and talents to bless us all. Just before we pray, I'd like to share a quick thought with you. Last year, one of my very good friends at Seagate, Mary, gave me a little present. It was this little pocket diary. And I don't know if you can read the words on the front of it. Let me read it to you. It says, best year ever. You know, I've looked at those words almost every day during lockdown and thought about them. Best year ever? I don't think so. A year where people have been physically separated from those they love. When celebrations or special events like weddings, birthday parties, holidays, moving house have been postponed. When people have lost their jobs or their businesses, or even worse, lost the people they love and haven't been able to grieve properly for them. I've often thought of how strange and almost cruel those words on that diary cover are. But this week, I've been challenged by God to think again. I felt him saying to me, you know, I don't judge success of a year or even a life for that matter in the same way you so often do. Take the time to find out how this could still be the best year ever. I came to bring you life, life in all its fullness. Have you really truly discovered yet what that means? I'll leave that thought with you to ponder today. Now let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning as a scattered family, all in our own homes, but we're so grateful for this opportunity to be united together in spirit. We thank you for your presence with each of us this morning. And in the past few days, we've been thinking about and showing our appreciation for those who've made big sacrifices on our behalf. Key workers serving on the front line at the moment, and also those who fought for our country many years ago. We're humbled and so grateful for these real life heroes. And as I listened to a recovered patient on TV this week, she expressed that feeling of just not having the words to convey how much she wanted to thank the people who had cared for her during her dark times. And it reminded me of how I often feel when I come before you and start to thank you for the incredible sacrifice you made for me and the rest of humanity when you allowed your precious son to take the punishment which we were due. Words cannot express my thankfulness, but I never grow weary of trying to express what you mean to me. And so I thank you for what I know to be true of you, a perfect father, full of compassion, awesome in power, merciful, faithful, able, and in complete control, even during uncertain times. This morning, I want to ask that you will be with us during our time together. I ask that you will meet the needs of all who may be tuning in today. We all come with different needs, but we come confident that you are able to meet them. So today, I'm thinking of those who need encouragement or who need a wee uplift, a wee energy boost. Those who need to be challenged or who need their homes to be filled with your presence and patience. Others who need wisdom and guidance about something, or those who need peace and comfort in a time of sorrow. Those who need protection, those with broken hearts or troubled minds, who need healing or just a hug. God, you accept us and love us just the way we are. So we come before you this morning, just as we are, 
asking you to meet our various needs. We also bring other groups of people before you too. Key workers in healthcare and emergency services, supermarket workers, delivery drivers, teachers, scientists working on developing tests and treatments and vaccines, leaders in governments, volunteers, and there's so many more. Father, please bless them, scoop them up, renew their energy levels, and give our leaders wisdom and discernment as they make important decisions, some of them with life or death consequences. We also want to bring our Seagate Church family to you, starting with our children and teenagers. We thank you for them. Thank you for their resilience and general acceptance of the restrictions that have been placed on them. We love them and we miss seeing them all face to face. Thank you for those who are continuing to lead ministries, especially Richard and Christina. Thank you for all the skills and talents you have equipped our church with. For those preparing the daily devotionals, leading Bible studies, setting quizzes and challenges, organising prayer times, even those lasting 52 hours, providing practical and pastoral support, and using technology to prepare services like this one. Fill your church up with energy and inspiration. Show us your heart for those around us, and may we not grow weary in serving you. This week, show us who is in need, who needs to be loved and looked after, and give us the courage to reach out so no one feels lonely or forgotten about during this time. Finally, I want to pray for those who might be tuning in today and they're really seeking you. Perhaps they're thinking of joining the Christianity Explored course from their own home. God, give them the confidence to do this and to register right now. Father, it's just possible that for someone listening to this, this really will be the best year ever. A year when they found out about your love for them and the difference this can make to life here and beyond. And as we later turn to read the Bible and listen to Thomas, I pray that you will prepare our hearts and minds. Father, today we're going to be thinking about you being the door or the gate. And at this time, when many of our doors that we normally walk through are closed to us, I thank you that the door to you is wide open and you welcome us through it. Help us to lay aside anything that might be concerning us or distracting us. Help us to stay focused and don't let our minds wander. Quiet in our homes and our hearts. And fill Thomas with the thoughts and words you want him to say. And may our ears be open. May we come hungry to be filled. May our minds be like sponges and not like sieves. And don't let us stand up from our sofas unchanged. Imprint everything you want us to hear on our hearts. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now I'm handing over to some of our youth to hear what life has been like in lockdown for them. Hi, we're the Ingles and we're going to share our lockdown experience. So our average day starts about one when we wake <laughs> up. Um, we've been doing a lot of baking, spending time together as a family, exercising, which has been good. Uh, I've enjoyed catching up on sleep and um, just relaxing. I find it difficult how we don't have exams this year and not being able to, to see my friend has been quite difficult as well. Um, I've quite enjoyed lockdown. I've learned new skills that I wouldn't usually have learned, like sewing and I've also baked a lot more as well. 
Uh, the things I've not enjoyed about lockdown is not seeing my family and friends and not sure what the future holds. I also have enjoyed it as I've learned new hobbies, as in guitar. I've also enjoyed the kind of relaxation bit is that you, you get to do what you want, wake up when you want, there's no really the stress. It is kind of bittersweet as well as this year would have been my last year, especially as school captain. You don't kind of get all that last year feeling as if you've got the last couple of days, the excitement, especially this period, it's dead exciting. You have, you've worked really hard for exams. And then it comes to a bit of your last exam, you, you have no stress. You, you, you've done your last exam, you've got nothing to do and you can just prepare for uni. That's the bit, that's the bit that's exciting. I've also missed the haircuts, to be honest. Hi, my name is Richard Woods and I am the pastor here at Seagate Church in Troon. These are really challenging and difficult times that we are living through as we come to terms with this coronavirus pandemic. It's a really difficult and challenging time. And because of that, we wanted to offer you the opportunity to come and ask the big questions of life. Is there a God? Why would God allow things like the coronavirus to happen? Maybe to think about who is Jesus Christ? Why did he come? What would it mean to follow him? What does it mean to be a Christian? In short, we want you to come and ask your questions about the Christian faith, to find out what it is that we believe, to find out why we believe that the good news of Jesus Christ is the best news that you will ever, ever hear. Why he brings hope even in the midst of these really difficult and challenging times. So if those are questions that you've been wrestling with or you've been thinking about looking at the Christian faith, we want to invite you to come and join us on our Christianity Explored course on Zoom, which will start on Monday the 11th of May. If you can't make the first one, it's okay, you can join later. The course will run for seven weeks and we'd be delighted to meet you, just to hear your questions, just to interact with you and to explain to you the basis of the Christian faith. It's an opportunity for you to test drive the Christian faith, to test drive it to destruction, if you like. Um, but we'd love to hear from you, love to wrestle with these issues. And the great thing is, you can do it from the comfort of your own home. You can sit on the sofa and join us uh, from the very uh, comfort of your own home with a cup of tea, and we'd love to meet you over Zoom. If you wanna join us, Go to the website seagatechurch.org.uk forward slash Christianity Explored. You'll be able to register for the course and all the details that you need for Zoom will be there. We'd love to see you there. Thanks for listening. Um, just some announcements before I pray for Thomas and Thomas brings God's word. Um, Tomorrow night, as Richard has said, on a, a Monday at 7.30 we Christianity Explored. Tuesday at 3 o'clock the suit-up course is, um, is going through the armour of God and if you want to join in with that then please uh, email Richard and uh, he will give you the details. Uh, Tuesday night at 7.30 the regular church prayer time again done over Zoom. And if you want to join us, then uh, please, again, just connect with the church and we will give you the, the code to, to be able to connect with um, Zoom and to join us in prayer. Uh, Wednesday night at 8 o'clock, we have um, the Women's Prayer Night, again, done on Zoom. Um, I'm sure other platforms are available. Um, and then Friday at 7 o'clock, we have uh, another time of prayer at 7 a.m. in the morning. And again, if you want to join us, then please just connect with Richard and he will... Um, give you the details for that. We've just come off the back of a, a 52 hour um, prayer um, session and again it's just been brilliant to spend time together uh, praying consistently and using this crisis as an opportunity to to wrestle with God, to uh, plead with God. And again remember also that we have our devotionals and again it's been so, so wonderful, such a rich variety of people who are just sharing their experience of uh, what God is saying to them just now. So again please tune in to our daily devotionals which I think you'll find greatly enriching and, and blessing. Um, let's just uh, turn and uh, turn to God again and pray um, as Thomas brings God's word. 
Father, we've got so much to be grateful for. Um, we pray for those who, who are suffering and we pray for those who are um, grieving, who have lost loved ones. We pray for those who are exhausted for, through the work that they do. Um, we pray, Lord, for, for your um, hand of restoration to be upon people. We pray for our leaders. We pray for Boris Johnston and Nicola Sturgeon. We just pray for your wisdom and guidance upon them as they make decisions about lockdown. We pray, Lord, that we would not go through uh, a, a difficult second wave. Um, we pray for the economy and for those, Lord, that are going to be affected through um, the challenges that this is going to bring through the economy. Um, Lord, we thank you. And once again, we trust in you as our shepherd, that you are our shepherd, that you are the open door and Lord I just pray for Thomas and I thank you for him and for his uh, wonderful family and, and just pray as he brings God's word that you would um, speak through him powerfully. I pray you open up our hearts and ears and our eyes that we would hear, see and understand what you're saying to us. Uh, Lord through the Holy Spirit may you convict us, may you change us, may you build your church as we listen to your word. And we just thank you, Lord, for one another. We thank you for the rich array of uh, well, gifts we've got in our church, uh, for people like um, Callum and uh, for Craig and for Phil that do all the online work for us, that enable us to stream so seamlessly and so well, for our pastor, Richard, for uh, Christina, our youth worker, for those that lead worship. Lord, we've got so much to be grateful for, and we just pray that you would um, just join our hearts together um, over this uh, service. In Jesus' name and for your glory's sake. Amen. John chapter 10 verses 1 to 10 Jesus is the Good Shepherd I assure you, anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. For a shepherd enters through the gate. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep hear his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they recognise his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't recognise his voice. Those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant, so he explained it to them. I assure you, I am the gate for the sheep, he said. All others who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. Wherever they go, they will find green pastures. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give life in all its fullness. Amen.
Well, good morning and a very warm welcome to you uh, to Seagate Church this morning. It's great that you have tuned in uh, to the service this morning and I very much hope that it is a blessing to you. Some of you will be used to sitting in the, the rows of chairs that lie empty in front of me uh, and some of you might never have even set foot in this building. But however you come this morning, uh, it is great that you have joined us as we now open up God's Word together. This morning we come to the third part in uh, our seven part series on the I Am Sayings of Jesus and our title today is I Am the Door or I Am the Gate uh, depending on which translation you have in front of you. Uh, if you've missed the last two then I can highly recommend uh, checking them out on the YouTube channel when you get the chance. When I found out I was preaching on I Am the Door the first thing that came into my head was uh, a phrase not from the Bible but one from my dad and I think also my grandpa. Some of you may also have been told that you make a better door than a window. Uh, code, by the way, for get out of the way, you're blocking my view. Um, usually of the TV. But when Jesus says, I am the door, he's not talking about getting in the way. He's saying that he is the way. And you know, these I am sayings are the things that Jesus said about himself. They're so rich and so encouraging and so powerful. Uh, they speak to us today as powerfully as they did back then when he first said them. But of course, as with all these things that Jesus says, there is great encouragement, but also great challenge. And I think there are two fundamental questions for us uh, in life, and there are these. Who did Jesus say that he was? And who do we say that Jesus is? Now, Jesus was pretty clear about who he was. He is the Son of God, the Lord, the promised Messiah, the Saviour of the world. And this series on the I Am sayings should give us a deeper insight into the real Jesus and what he came to do. But the more pressing question is this, and if you've not already considered it, then I would urge you to consider it this morning. Who do you say that Jesus is? Because if you give the right answer to that question, then you open up the way to eternal life with God himself. Because you see, if Jesus really is God, and he is, then it matters what we think of him. Now John helpfully tells us the purpose of his gospel, that this gospel we're reading in, in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, he says this, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is a Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in you may have life in his name. And so if Jesus Christ is our Lord, if we believe in him, then we can enjoy the everlasting blessings that brings. We can have life and life to the full. Now, two weeks ago, if you were with us, Richard took us through John 6, where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then last week, it was John 8, and I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And in today's passage, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. There is a pattern in these three sayings that we have dealt with so far, and it's that of the contrast of life with and life without Jesus. We will be fed and not be hungry. We will walk in light and not darkness. We will have life, not death. And as I said earlier, John's main purpose in writing is that we believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and that in doing so, we have life in all its fullness. So I've got three headings for you uh, this morning as we look at these 10 verses together. Firstly, the shepherd and the sheep pen, verse 1 to 5. Secondly, baffled and bewildered bystanders, verse 6. And thirdly, life lived with the Lord, verses 7 to 10. The shepherd and the sheep pen, baffled and bewildered bystanders, and life lived with the Lord. First, let me give you a little bit of context before we get into our first point. In chapter 9, Jesus has healed a man who was blind from birth. The man could not see 
and now he can see. And it's an incredible miracle. The man gives Jesus the credit publicly, but the Pharisees have him thrown out of the synagogue because they're not happy that he healed on the Sabbath. And it's into this context that Jesus speaks and we have our passage. Verse 1. I tell you the truth, anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. Now, shepherding was a common vocation in Jesus' day, and so he used this example as it would have been familiar to his listeners. He engaged with them uh, on their level. And to put a modern spin on this idea, I'm sure you'll have been uh, to an event or a venue where you've had to wear uh, a a band or a stamp or, or some sort of ticket to show that you've paid and you're meant to be in there. Well, I once heard a story about a group of people who were out for the evening and uh, they'd had a meal together and they decided to go to go on to, to a bar. But it was getting on and there was, there was some sort of curfew that meant that although the place was still open, no one was allowed in after midnight, I mean eight o'clock. But not to put, be put off, this group of friends began to look for another way in. It just so happened there was a fire escape at the back and uh, they knocked on the door and somebody let them in. So in they went and into the building and and up to the bar and ordered a drink. And everyone was feeling quite pleased with themselves. But if anyone had challenged this group of friends, they would not have been able to produce a ticket or a wristband or a stamp to prove that they were legitimately inside. And they would probably have been kicked out. But this group was never challenged, or so I'm told. But the point is, If you don't go through the correct entrance, then you have no right to be there. And you'd be in the place of the thieves and the robbers in verse 1. But contrast this now with verses 2 and 3. The one who enters the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own by name and leads them out. Here's how it would be. For safety, groups of shepherds, each with their own flock of sheep, would share a sheep pen overnight. It would probably be a fairly rough structure. Four dry stone walls, or dry stained dikes if you prefer, and some sort of timber roof for a bit of protection from the elements and to try and keep intruders out. They would probably have taken it in turns to to watch over the sheep and, and stand guard at the door each night or they may have hired a watchman to do that for them. And as we move on into verses 4 and 5, Jesus is picking up on the fact that in the morning, each shepherd would go to the gatekeeper and he'd be let in because the gatekeeper would know that he was a true shepherd. Then the shepherd would call his own sheep and they would follow him. Dozens or or maybe even hundreds of sheep in this enclosure, but each one of them would go only in the voice of their own shepherd. And I I don't know about you, but my knowledge of farming is fairly limited and I find it incredible, but it's true. And I watched a a brilliant and and quite funny video the other day of a a number of different people trying to call in a flock of sheep. And no matter what they said, and they tried their best to emulate the, the call and the voice of the shepherd, the sheep just kept chilling in that field, munching their grass. But then the farmer steps in and calls them, And they stop and they lift their heads, they turn towards them, and one by one they come in. It's brilliant. And so in this sense of the picture of the sheep and the shepherds, the people listening to Jesus would have known exactly what he was talking about. They got it literally, but they did not get the message that he was trying to portray through this. And that takes us on to our second point this morning, the baffled and bewildered bystanders. Look at verse 6. Those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant, so he explained it to them. Now, among others, those listening to Jesus uh, were the Pharisees that we spoke about at the beginning, and they really should have got it. There are so many references to God as the shepherd of of his flock, of his people Israel, uh, throughout the Old Testament. And here are just a few that come from the Psalms. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I have all that I need. Or 77 verse 20, you led your people along that road like a flock of sheep. 
with Moses and Aaron as their shepherds. 79, 13, then we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will thank you forever and ever. And my final example from Psalm 100, verse 3, acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And these verses speak of the amazing provision uh, that we have from God, our great shepherd. And the Pharisees uh, should have picked up on that theme, but apparently not. Now, granted, they didn't have a Bible app where you can type in the word sheep and get every passage in the Bible containing that word up in an instant. But they would have known their scriptures well. And it's funny because it's not just that they didn't pick up on this reference to uh, the connection between God, his people being a flock, and God himself being the shepherd. But they didn't get a bit of a specific dig that Jesus was aiming at them through that story. And it goes back to, to Ezekiel 34. Now, Ezekiel was one of the, the prophets in the Old Testament, and he's speaking at this point to the Jews who have been exiled from Jerusalem. Ezekiel is told by the Lord to, to prophesy against the shepherds, the, the leaders of Israel at that time. And listen to what he says in verses 2 and 3. What sorrow awaits you, shepherds, who feed yourselves instead of your flocks? Shouldn't shepherds feed their sheep? You drink the milk, wear the wool, and butcher the best animals. But you let your flocks starve. You have not taken care of the weak. Now, this chapter in Ezekiel talks of the, the sins of the leaders. It then goes on to describe the judgment that they would face and how a new shepherd would come and look after the flock, securing its fate. And compare this with the Pharisees that Jesus is referring to in our passage. Remember that in chapter 9, he's healed, Jesus has healed a man who was blind from birth. And because this man tells the Pharisees that it was Jesus who healed him, they throw him out of the synagogue. In both cases, in Ezekiel and in this passage in John today, the religious leaders of the day fail to properly care for the people. And that's why in John 9.39, Jesus, when he's responding to the Pharisees uh, who ask if he thinks that they are blind, says to them, if you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty. But you remain guilty because you claim you can see. And it's not just that they couldn't see uh, that Jesus was the, the long-promised Messiah, the one true shepherd, but they had blatantly rejected and, and ignored their duty of care to this man. The man was blind, but now he could see. Spiritually, he was dead, and now he was alive. But all they cared about was the fact that Jesus had healed them on the Sabbath, and they didn't want anything to do with him. Imagine for a minute somebody arrived at Seagate one Sunday morning and all excited because they'd become a Christian, they'd found forgiveness and new life in Jesus Christ. And the person on the door asks a bit about the story and how it had come to be. But it turns on that this person was saved at an event put on by another church somewhere else. And all of a sudden the attitude changes and the door closes and we don't want anything to do with them. Now, of course, this would not happen here. I know that. But the point is this, the Pharisees are not good shepherds. They're not caring for the flock, for God's people. They care more about their own sense of self-importance and pride. And they're too jealous about the, pop, eh, the popularity of Jesus to acknowledge that he could actually have done something good. But I guess the question for us is, what is the, the point that Jesus is trying to make to the Pharisees? Why bother using this example of the sheep and the shepherd? Well, Jesus was illustrating a very specific point as well as a much bigger one. And, and dealing with this specific illustration, um, situation, the blind man in chapter, chapter 9 is the sheep who recognized the voice of the shepherd, Jesus, but then ran away from the stranger, the Pharisees. And the big picture message brings us on to our third point of life lived with the Lord. Let's look at verse 7. I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. 
This is the second time that Jesus has used this phrase, I tell you the truth, in the passage. In different translations, it's very truly I tell you, or truly, truly I tell you. Basically, sit up and listen. What I'm about to tell you is true and it's important because you really don't get it yet, do you? And what Jesus goes on to say is as controversial today as it was back then. I am the gate for the sheep. To go back to that sheep pen example, Jesus is zoning in on the fact that there is only one gate and the gate is the only way in. Everyone listening would have known that much. But let's make another point about the, the shepherd who stood at the gate. Quite often they would literally lie down at the gate or the door as the protector of the flock. Anything that wanted to harm the flock would have to go through him first. And think about what that means. If you are in the flock, if you are a follower of Christ, then he is your great protector. He has literally laid down his life to save yours. And listen to what he says to a, a different group of religious leaders a little bit later on in the chapter, verse 27. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. For my father has given them to me. And he is more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. And that's caused a big problem for the Pharisees and others because Jesus is claiming that he is God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And the problem at the time, as I said, was the Pharisees and other religious leaders wanted people to follow them to follow their rules and to do things their way. And no one could fault their commitment to that cause, but they had been blinded to the truth. The Jewish faith that they held so dearly to should have allowed them to see Jesus for who he really was. Everything in the Old Testament, which is a scripture that they would have had and known so well, it all points to Jesus, the sacrificial system, the promises, the prophecy, and the whole narrative is building up to this crescendo in Jesus Christ. And yet here he is standing in front of them and they could not see him for who he really was. Verse 8, all who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. I want you to think about this for a second. It's a direct message for these false leaders, false teachers, and he's equating them with thieves and with robbers. Now, we all know that Jesus spoke uh, the truth boldly, but if these Pharisees were switched on enough to pick up to it, Jesus was saying that their message was false and that they had stolen the truth away from it. They thought they were doing God's work. But Jesus said they were false teachers. And as far as the Pharisees were concerned, it was things like this that would build their case for wanting to have him arrested and killed. But even today, there are thieves and there are robbers out there, false teachers, people who claim to speak for God, but are at best severely misguided, or at worst, from Satan. And sadly, there are people who have power and influence that are leading people away from the truth. They are on TV, they are in churches, and even leading churches. But we must stand up boldly and, like Jesus, speak the truth to power without fear. Verse 9, Jesus says, Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. Nothing else can save you. No other worldview or faith system can save you. Not even attempting to keep the Jewish law can save you. Only I can save you, Jesus is saying. He is the only way to God. 
And let me be very clear about something this morning. There is no other way in. There is no other way to be saved. And we all need saving. We all fall short of the glory of God. None of us makes that great. Not one of us can get right with God in our own strength. So please don't fall into the trap of of believing that you're a, a good person and all the good things you do will get you into heaven. They won't. And don't think also that aren't all religions just the same? They all end up in the same place. So as long as I'm kind of in touch with my spiritual side, then I'll be okay. But let me tell you, they're not all the same and you won't be okay. Maybe though you're like the Pharisees. On the outside, it all looks good. Going to church, you maybe know your Bible, perhaps even uh, go to a house group. But Jesus says, I am the gate. And that means that to fix our broken relationship with God, we must go through him. And to do that, we have to have a living relationship with him. Do you know Jesus this morning? Do you really know him? When was the last time that you spoke to him? One of the I am sayings that we'll come to slightly later in the series is in John 14. And Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There isn't a clearer way of putting it than that. There is only one way to God the Father, and that is through the gate. And the gate is a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. And look then at what he says about those who are saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. Not only are we saved from the punishment that our sins deserve, but we're saved for eternity with Jesus. We're free from the weight of sin and of darkness and all the things that hold us back. Only Jesus can give you that type of freedom. If the Son sets you free, John 8, 36, you will be free indeed. Verse 10. The thief's purpose is to steal and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Or life and life to the full, as the NIV says. This is one of those verses that I'm sure many of us will have committed to memory a long time ago. But there's a good chance, I think, if we're honest with ourselves, that when we think of life to the full, we think of this life, and we imagine a perfect life here on earth. And people stick that verse up in the fridge door or somewhere in their house, and they feel all warm and fuzzy inside because we think that Jesus said our life is going to be great. Now, there might be great bits in your life, but there will be hard times and there will be difficult circumstances. Right now, we are living in one of the most challenging set of circumstances for generations. But, you know, one of the most insightful comments that I've heard on this verse came from a story a minister friend of mine told me a number of years ago. He was visiting an elderly lady who was ill and very close to to being home with the Lord. And she commented that it was this verse that gave her so much hope. She wasn't upset because she was leaving life to the full behind her. She was hopeful because she knew that life to the full was still to come. And that's where she was going. And this idea of life to the full or life in all its abundance It points back to the Garden of Eden in Genesis and the picture of Adam and Eve walking and talking in relationship with God in the Garden. But of course, the fall and sin shattered that life. But in Revelation 21, we have a foretaste again of what life to the full really will be. Listen to this, verses 2 to 4. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. 
He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. Jesus came to give us rich and satisfying life. Life in abundance, life to the full. And this is the life that we were created for. It was C.S. Lewis that said, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world will satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. We heard how Jesus calls his own sheep and uh, leads them out by name. And maybe this morning you have heard the faint whisper of Jesus calling your name, calling you to follow him. Maybe you've been a believer for years and, and the challenge for you this morning is to grow deeper in your relationship with God, to follow Jesus even more closely. But perhaps you've heard that call this morning for the very first time. Perhaps as that song goes, you've been searching far and wide for answers. And this morning you're realizing that these are answers maybe only God provides. That offer of life to the full is there for us all. I began by asking the question, who do you say that Jesus is? And that question remains. Because the Bible says that one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That day is coming and there is only one gate. Without Jesus, the path leads to death in our sins. But with Jesus, the path leads to forgiveness of sins and life, life to the full. And however great or terrible a life you might have had here on this earth, all that will matter on that day is your answer to that question from Jesus. Who do you say that I am? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you this morning that even though we are apart, we are together in you. Thank you for your word this morning, which is true and which is so encouraging and challenging and inspiring. Thank you, Lord, that you are the gate, that you have made a way for us to, for that relationship with you to be fixed. And Father, we just give you thanks again this morning for that offer of life and life to the full. Amen. So now we come uh, to the communion table, physically apart, but together in the Lord ar around the table. Let me read you the, the verses uh, that will be familiar to many of us from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verse 23. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. We'll close our service this morning by worshipping God together again. And so I'll hand over to Dylan. Thanks, Dylan.
used to be for creation Eternity in your hands You spoke the earth into motion My soul now to stand to be for my failures you carried the cross for my shame my sin went upon your shoulders my soul now stands so what can I say But offer this heart, oh God, to So I walk upon salvation, the Spirit alive in me. It's like to Well, thanks very much for tuning in this morning. It's been great to have you with, with us here at Seagate Church. Uh, thank you also to everyone who has been a part of the service this morning, to Mark, to Dylan, 
Alison, to Bryony, Laurie and Callum, uh, to Richard and Maria, uh, and uh, finally a huge thanks to Callum and everyone who helped put this together. Let me close with Paul's words to the Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. God bless you. to